All right, where we left off on animating, we are up to frame eight. And we have a big transformation from frame one to frame eight in our folders. And I remember I can always run just a really rough animation test by just turning on the eyeballs of my folders. Now, you'll notice already that some of these transitions are smoother than others. Like from four to five, that's a nice smooth transition. And then from five to six, now nah, it's a little bit more of a jump forward. And then from six to seven, that's a pretty smooth transition. From seven to eight, that's a pretty smooth transition. So we're gonna have to add some in-between frames to smooth out some of the big jumps, which mostly happen in the beginning. But let's get to frame nine you know, as quickly as we can. So what I'm gonna do is make a copy of what I've done in frame eight. Command J, duplicate, move that up to my folder for frame nine, or my group for frame nine. In Photoshop, they call these folders groups. Oh, and I had already done that. Okay, so now I'm really thinking, well, what's my intention? Well, I want this to be the end transformation. So this, this is where I can kind of go for broke a little bit. And I don't want it to look like a cheesy vector image anymore. And I can look at my inspiration for it. Which I'm going to move up so I can easily access. And my inspiration for it is kind of like this guy. So a lot of diversity and strangeness in how it's done. And so I'm going to do that with a layer above the layer before. And I'm going to start kind of painting over it. But before that, I want to finalize some of the, the big areas. So I want to move these horns down and change them permanently into ears. Everything has to pay off in your transformation, right? Anything you've been moving and changing needs to continue to move and change. So what I should do is Command X and then paste onto a new layer. And now I can move these both individually using Control T and these same skills used over and over again. Move them a little bit lower on the head. And sometimes this will happen when it's just you doing an animation test. You'll, you'll see your final frame and you'll realize, you know what, I didn't do anything with the chin this whole time, and I really should have. And so then you decide, okay, is it worth it? Is it worth all the work it's gonna to do to go back across all my frames and slowly change the chin? Because it doesn't make sense to just change it at the very end. Or am I okay working with the things I did remember, right? Like I just started to change the mouth. So now I'm allowed to change the mouth, but I can't introduce a brand new thing in the last keyframe. So the reason we did the animatic and we sketched it out ahead of time is to kind of keep us on track and keep us honest. We don't want to add a new task at the very end because we just won't be able to, to do it justice. But if you find yourself with a lot of extra time, then there's always you know, new improvements you can find. And that's also why we're not animating this uh, frame by frame. Instead, we're just doing the keyframes first. And then we'll go back and we'll do the in-betweens where we think they're needed. So I'm gonna soften my tools a little bit because I'm going for that not so vector looking, you know, rougher kind of raster appearance in my final frame. 
and I'll keep adjusting the colors. Wait, but the, are you going to open the mouth? I don't know if I'm going to open it. I think I'm going to grow some teeth and like build more lips around it and make it less symmetrical. It's like stuff like that you'd have to completely change and add vectors, which is kind of like what I was talking about. Well, you could always add shapes on top of it. Yeah, so you get to decide what makes sense for you. And that's why sketching out is always a good idea. And I think I told you before, when we were doing the little storyboard sketches, there isn't anything that's made professionally that moves. You know, no animation, no live action, no professional product that's committed to sequential images that you see that isn't storyboarded. Now, you're used to seeing probably more content now on a daily basis that's not storyboarded than ever before in history because of YouTube and because of you know, individual creators making stuff and putting it up. And you can call that professional in that they can derive some, some income from the advertising for that. But what I mean by professional is that you see it on actual media, right? You see it on, on TV networks, you see it on like official YouTube channels, or you see it in a movie theater. And every advertisement that's made, that's professional. You know, people pay for the quality of that work. So what's interesting about it is even if it's just like a local car commercial, if it's done through a professional agency, it's not just shot on someone's iPhone and then posted to YouTube, right? There's a distribution budget. It's trying to get on local airwaves. So before you commit that kind of money, you're going to to um, do the smart money in the in the early phases to storyboard it, to try out the ideas, to make sure they work. And so that's what we're doing with animation. And whenever it's animated, you certainly start with the storyboard because you can see how, how time consuming it is to kind of finish frames off. And same thing with special effects. Special effects are always sketched and storyboarded first because it's so expensive to make them if they don't actually get used in the final product, that's just an incredible waste of, of money and time. They're expensive because how tedious they are to make? Yep. It's exactly what I'm doing. Moving pixels around, making creative decisions, it's tedious. People don't do it for nothing, you know? <laughs> Especially if it's selling cigarettes or something that the person doesn't necessarily want for their own portfolio. Do you always have to show what you, like all of your work in your portfolio? No, of course. Um, you, you, pick, you pick and choose based on the job you're applying for, what you think shows them what you can offer and what you're most interested in, in creating in the future. So I once had a meeting, probably the biggest professional meeting I ever had. And it was shortly after I graduated with my BFA in illustration. And I, I was uh, kind of headhunted for, for a children's uh, illustration possibility for what they were calling like the Jewish version of a a children's Bible, you know, so illustrating stories from the Torah. And it was going to be like a, a 27 volume edition. And it was a project that would probably take around seven years. And it would be a full time thing. And so I, I was invited to take a meeting because they liked some of the work that had been shared with them. You know, the people that were financing this and I forget who the publication was. And I took a meeting at, at CAA, California um, like Artists Agency. And if you ever want to Google CAA, they're like the most powerful agents in the world. 
for creative people. And so it's this huge building in downtown LA and you enter the lobby and they have a, a Lichtenstein painting that is seven stories tall, you know, in their lobby. And they have all these conference rooms and everyone's in really fancy suits. And I'd brought samples of my illustration work that I thought kind of fit the project. And I'd even drawn some, some new samples um, kind of showing the kind of work I was most interested in doing at that moment. And I had it all in, a, in an accordion case as a portfolio because some of my pieces were on wood and some of my pieces were on illustration board. And this was before, you know, online portfolios were, were so common. And so they wanted to see live samples. So I bring all of that into the meeting and, and it goes really well, I think, except that the work that they responded to the most was the work I had done like three years before and was not really a technique I was interested in in spending the next seven years of my life on, right? So I was, what's the word? I was not as enthusiastic in, in their input, right? As I would have been if I really wanted the job. <laughs> and just was willing to do whatever they wanted for it. And so they, they asked for a second meeting and if I could prepare some samples along that line and I ended up actually declining, right? So you wanna only show portfolio work that you would actually be interested in doing. And my mistake was having those, er, those older samples in the portfolio at all. But I was still young, I didn't have a ton of samples and I was a little insecure, right? So yeah, you, your portfolio is your biggest communication tool. It shows what, what you can offer. So don't put anything in it that you're not proud of. Put your proudest work as the first thing in there. Put your, your second most favorite work as the last thing in there. So you leave them with a good impression. But don't ever put anything in there that you don't want to have to do again. <laughs> because unfortunately, even though it's a creative industry, there are, are precious few creative people that work on the money side of things. And that's true in movies, that's true in animation, it's true in, in illustration and print media. Um, so unfortunately, they're gonna hire you because they think you've already done the job that they want you to do. And so you're a safe bet to them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of stuff with our final project where you really get to gear it towards your own interests. But yeah, all the studio classes you can take right now, all the skills you can build, you will demonstrate through your portfolio. What format do you put your portfolio in? You just make like a PowerPoint or slideshow or something? Yeah, you can do it however they ask for it or however you think it looks best. But traditionally, or typically now, you would definitely have your own website. And then in, in illustration, like what I do, I also have what's called a print book with samples of past projects after they've actually been printed. So if, I, if I'm doing posters, I want to actually grab what that poster looks like when it's all finished and put it in a portfolio to show clients when I have a chance to. Because it, it looks different than on a website, right? If I'm making movie posters, I want some of those samples of the posters that have gone through the whole process. But if you're doing animation, you know, you want to have a YouTube channel. Lots of different ways. And a, a really good portfolio site is Behance, which was started by Adobe but you don't need to even own Adobe products to start a Behance page. But you'll see some really beautiful portfolio examples there. And we'll talk about that more at the end of the semester when, as we're putting together our final portfolios. And Digital Honors is, is well aware of those because I share a lot of the Behance portfolios as examples to them. All right. So every once in a while I can check in on the progress I've made.